The title of this presentation is A Century and a Half of George's Thinking About War and Peace. I'm Edward J. Dodson, and this was prepared for a webinar held the 17th of December 2022 by the International Union for Land Value Taxation and Free Trade. One should not be surprised that Leo Tolstoy, the author of War and Peace, commented frequently on the causes of war. One should not be surprised also, given that he came to embrace the principles embraced by Henry George by what he wrote in 1900 as war erupted in Southern Africa. These causes are threefold. Firstly, the unequal distribution of property, that is, the robbing of one part of humanity by the other. Secondly, the existence of the military class of men educated and foreappointed to murder. And thirdly, the fallacious and for the most part fraudulent religious teaching in which our young generations are forcibly educated. Fast forward to the year 1943 and we find the philosopher Mortimer J. Adler in deep thought about the same issues. In his book, How to Think About War and Peace, Adler in this passage sounds very much like someone who has absorbed some of the wisdom provided by Henry George. In the past, education has been hampered by economic slavery and by social inequalities. Worse than that, education itself has been a tool of the privileged classes. It has been misused to safeguard the status enjoyed by the few. In consequence, it has not merely been an instrument for oppressing the many, it has even failed to enlighten the few. Thus, it is not only that education is crucial to achieving peaceful relations between peoples, it is essential that a liberal education be provided to all persons because we are all political beings. Adler continues. All those who are in any way responsible for the education of others should employ education as a prime instrumentality for affecting the mental, moral, and cultural changes prerequisite to peace. They should recognize that education can function in many ways through enabling all persons to become citizens in fact as well as in right, thereby exercising an intelligent voice in their own affairs, through equalizing the races of people by remedying the accidentally conditioned or artificially induced immaturity of the so-called backward or primitive peoples, and above all, through instructing all persons about the possibility and probability of a durable worldwide peace the conditions of its attainability, and the rewards of its attainment. In his books and other writings, Henry George explored both the causes and consequences of our almost continuous history of warfare with one another. In the first chapter of his book, Social Problems, published in 1883, he warns that the destruction of war in the industrial age will far surpass anything that occurred in the past. It is startling to think how destructive in a civilization like ours would be such fierce conflicts as fill the history of the past. The wars of highly civilized countries since the opening of the era of steam and machinery have been duels of armies rather than conflicts of peoples or classes. And since 1870, to the knowledge of petroleum has been added that of even more destructive agents. The explosion of a little nitroglycerin under a few water mains would make a great city uninhabitable. As Henry George postulated his law of human progress toward the end of the book Progress and Poverty, first published in 1879, he observed that the very history of human migration and increase in population provided the conditions leading to conflict and war. As families and tribes are separated from each other, the social feeling ceases to operate between them, and differences arise in language, custom, tradition, religion. In short, 
and the whole social web which each community, however small or large, constantly spins. With these differences, prejudices grow, animosities spring up, contact easily produces quarrels, aggression begets aggression, and wrong kindles revenge. Now, warfare is the negation of association. The separation of men into diverse tribes by increasing warfare thus checks improvement. While in the localities where a large increase in numbers is possible without much separation, civilization gains the advantage of exemption from tribal war, even when the community as a whole is carrying on warfare beyond its borders. Thus, where the resistance of nature to the close association of men is slightest, the counterforce of warfare is likely at first to be least felt. And in the rich plains where civilization first begins, it may rise to a great height while scattered tribes are yet barbarous. And thus, when small, separated communities exist in a state of chronic warfare which forbids advance, the first step to their civilization is the advent of some conquering tribe or nation that unites these smaller communities into a larger one, in which internal peace is preserved. Where this power of peaceable association is broken up, either by external assaults or internal dissensions, the advance ceases and retrogression begins. One of Henry George's great insights about how we too often cause our own economic problems is found in the book Protection or Free Trade, published in 1886. Here he writes, What protectionism teaches us is to do to ourselves in time of peace what enemies seek to do to us in time of war. In the 6 April 1889 issue of George's newspaper, The Standard, he raised important questions about the need to create a strong naval force. Two of his considerations would lose validity as new technologies of warfare appeared and as the United States entered the global imperialist arena. Separated by 3,000 miles of ocean from the rivalries and enmities of Europe, seated without hostile neighbors on a continent where none would dream of measuring strength with us, what foe have we? What foe are we likely to have? Against whom we should need a navy. Standing navies and armies are incongruous with our institutions. They belong properly to monarchies and aristocracies, not to democratic republics. In the main, those who campaign with Henry George in the mission to replace all taxation with the public collection of the rent of land agreed with George that protectionist policies increased the potential for conflict and war between nations. This was certainly the case with Louis F. Post, whose weekly newspaper, The Public, covered not only U.S. imperialist moves, but those of every other nation. Here is one extract from an editorial appearing in 1898 the public's first year of publication. Post wrote, To shed blood for the collection of a debt, however just a debt, is unjust, whether on the part of a nation or of an individual. So would it be unjust to go to war over a mere boundary dispute. The one just cause for war is a continuous denial of liberty. And wars honestly fought to achieve or defend liberty provided the end it cannot be secured without war, are just. Near the end of the same month in 1898, the United States declared war against Spain, demanding that Spain relinquish its authority and government in Cuba and withdraw its land and naval forces. Almost immediately, the U.S. naval force entered Havana Harbor and established a blockade. Earlier in April, the public printed extracts from a sermon delivered in Cleveland, Ohio by Reverend Charles D. Williams, urging the nation's leaders to think more deeply of what they were unleashing. The patriotism of war is not the highest kind of patriotism, nor by any means the most difficult and most rare. It is comparatively easy and common. 
but the patriotism of peace is a higher, rarer, and harder thing than that. What worried Louis F. Post a great deal was the expansionary and anti-democratic intentions of what he referred to as the American plutocracy. And Post knew very well that the plutocracy had no intention of bringing to newly conquered territory a Georgia system of land tenure and taxation. Within weeks, a U.S. naval force brought the war to the Philippines. Already, opponents of U.S. foreign policy were holding anti-imperialist meetings. Michigan Governor Hazen Pingree declared, We are not in the colonizing business. It is the monopolists who desire this extension of our territory. With each year in the new 20th century, conflict between nations and peoples intensified. The rise of Japanese militarism was covered in the public by several correspondents. In 1905, a single taxer and missionary physician living in China named W.E. Macklin wrote, Fanatic patriotism and hero worship produce a type of soldier difficult to conquer. The Japs are an exceedingly immoral people, so their military prestige is not due to moral superiority though they are self-restrained by patriotic devotion. The elegant, refined, artistic Jap, with his indomitable, hardy farmer populations to train into soldiers, truly, this is a world problem, and the nations are not awake to it. In 1905, President Theodore Roosevelt helped to achieve a negotiated peace between the Japanese and Russians. Congratulating him on this outcome, the leader of the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, William Jennings Bryan, urged Roosevelt to argue for a step Bryan believed could establish the basis for permanent peace. Bryan wrote, Why not ask Congress for authority to submit all international questions, when an agreement cannot be reached by parties interested, to an impartial board for investigation and report? If leading nations of the world would enter into an agreement to join in the creation of such a board and pledge themselves to submit all disputes to the board for investigation before declaring war, the danger of war would be reduced to a minimum. A well-known author and strong proponent of the single tax doctrine, Bolton Hall, spoke at the Shaker Peace Convention that same year. He told them, the world's peace can come only when the world is ready for it, when the spirit of love has so entered into men's minds that they are incapable of war, incapable of unkindness. As we might expect, the remainder of his address explained to convention attendees that internal, individual peace could be realized if only the land question could be resolved although Bolton Hall allowed that other options existed besides that put forward by Henry George. As World War erupted in 1914, bringing nation after nation into the conflict, a member of Britain's parliament, Francis Nielsen, responded with his analysis of how this all happened in the book, How Diplomats Make War. The outcome of 10 years of diplomatic labor and entente enterprises amounted to suspicion and enmity, distrust and hate, leading up to the only possible climax, a continental war. He went on to warn that nothing would change until nations achieved essential systemic reforms. Governments will look after their own interests, but with people it is different for no government will do anything really worthwhile for them unless they keep clearly in view all those factors which have caused so much suffering and death and firmly decide to rid themselves of pernicious systems which foment wars. A quarter of a century later, Nielsen would again raise the same concerns. 
Comparing the situation as it is today with that of Europe after the last armistice, we find a chaos in the world unimaginable to the mind of anyone who had anything to do with the conduct of the last war. The whole world is concerned in this struggle, and the fate of many millions on every continent lies in the hands of a few men. Therefore, it is imperative that we should think of the people who are goaded in blind ignorance of their future to support schemes for reconstruction which they will repudiate at the first opportunity when they are free of the restraints under which they now live. As the world's leaders struggled with the challenges of the new world they were creating after the war ended, Lewis F. Post offered his perspectives in the British publication Land Values. Let the war be settled on free trade principles, and Alsace and Lorraine will cease to be a problem. There will be no colonial problems, no problem of free seas, and agreements for disarmament and arbitration will execute themselves. Let the people of the world freely trade, and there will be no wars between the nations of the world. There would be nothing to go to war about. Between the two world wars in 1926, the International Union for Land Value Taxation and Free Trade was organized with its headquarters in London. The very next year, the IU submitted a statement titled, The Economic Causes of War to the World Economic Conference held in Geneva, Switzerland. There was still a vibrant Bowdoin reform movement in Germany until the arrival of National Socialism. It was led by Dr. Adolf de Mosk and Dr. Otto Julius Berger. De Mosk died in 1935, apparently of natural causes. Julius Berger left Germany in July of 1941, coming to the United States. In an article appearing in the May-June 1942 issue of Land and Freedom, he provided an important insight into the challenges the few Georges faced in Germany even before Hitler's takeover. On the whole, the educated classes in Germany are deplorably unfamiliar with the significance of land and land reform. One who has followed the trends of the so-called educated classes in Germany and who has felt the effects of their behavior will be obliged to comment on their total ignorance of sociological knowledge, particularly of the works of Henry George. Sidney J. Abelson was a regular contributing writer to the publication The Freeman from the late 1930s until the early 1950s. As much of Europe and Asia were already engulfed in war, he thought about what would come afterward. In an article titled Winning the Peace, Appearing in the May-June 1951 issue of The Freeman, he wrote this. Americans are worried not so much about the war problem as they are about the peace problem. It is easy enough to make a war. It seems impossible to make a lasting peace. Here is the great opportunity that presents itself now to America. After the war is won by the democracies, we can win the peace. But all this can be done only by making freedom a complete and practical reality. It calls for a new abolition, the abolition of the freedom-destroying speculation in land. It calls for the establishment of every man's right to use the earth on equal terms with every other man. During the late 1930s, the Henry George School of Social Science brought in Frank Shadoroff as director. Shadoroff was strongly opposed to U.S. entry into the Second World War, a position that made the school's board of trustees uncomfortable after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Shadoroff soon left to establish the journal Analysis. As the war in Europe ended, he offered his The Formula for Peace to his readers. What exactly is peace? To say that it is the absence of conflict is merely to describe peace negatively, not to explain it. It calls for no elaborate investigation to establish the fact that the principle of peace is production, while that of war is destruction. But that does not help us unless we ascertain the nature and purpose of production. 
Peace becomes a relationship between human beings in which the normal impulse to better their circumstances through an ever-increasing fund of goods and services is uninterrupted. Whenever that mainspring is tampered with, peace is on the way out. The principle of destruction, war, has set to work. An unsigned editorial titled Nationalism and Internationalism appeared in the May 1945 issue of Land and Liberty, analyzing what was achieved in San Francisco toward formation of a world security organization. Land and Liberty's editors were not impressed. The fundamental error and danger in all such proposals is that they continue to personify the nation or certain sections and privileged groups within it. They assume that such organizations will serve the interests of the citizens generally and that they can be made amenable to administration which puts the interests of the generality of individuals first. These assumptions are untrue. Such organizations of their very nature are beyond any effective control. It took until 1949 for members of the IU to hold a post-war international conference. In August, they met in England. Among the papers read at the conference was one on the Second World War submitted by E.J. Craigie, a former member of the Australian Parliament. Craigie wrote, Looking back along the pages of history, we see that irrespective of the label under which political parties may function, not one of them has attempted to bring an end to war by attacking its fundamental cause. They have preferred to try to deal with this great evil by spending millions of pounds on defense. If this illogical policy is to continue, then it is only a matter of time when our so-called civilization will end in disaster. Perhaps the most radical proposal for preventing future wars came from the unlikely pen of John Maynard Keynes. As the Second World War was coming to an end, Keynes argued the case for breaking up the world's most powerful nations into many small nation states. The views expressed by Keynes were repeated by Leopold Kor in the 1974 book, The Breakdown of Nations. The dreaded result of a society's behavior is the consequence of the power that is generated by excessive social size. For whenever a nation becomes large enough to accumulate the critical mass of power, it will in the end accumulate it. And when it has acquired it, it will become an aggressor, its previous record and intentions to the contrary notwithstanding. An in-depth review of George's writings over the last century and a half has been beyond me for this presentation. That said, I feel comfortable saying that the above quotes are representative of George's perspectives. I end with a few observations made by Robert Clancy, director of the Henry George Institute, in the summer 1984 issue of the George's Journal. Here Clancy writes, William James noted that wars bring out strong commitments and great deeds which do not seem to carry over into peacetime. One can see why the dedication and determination of wartime does not carry over into peacetime the moral equivalent of war, as James called it. The special privileges of the few and the deprivation of the many destroy the common purpose. A just solution of the land question would be the right place to start in order to improve the common interest.